So this is where we stopped last time. Uh, this next few slides is a, just a very basic introduction to structural geology. You've probably seen it uh, in your geology course you took as a freshman or maybe even in high school. So um, this, is, uh, this is not my expertise. Um, if you were to take this class from Dr. Olson, for example, who hadn't taught this class in a long time, but, if, uh, but used to teach this class, you'd have a week and a half or two weeks of structural geology. But I'm a mechanics guy, so we're going to have like one and a half lectures of structural geology, and then we'll fill in that other time with good mechanics. So anyway, uh, obviously, the Earth, uh, there's a picture there. This is not to scale because um, the crust on, on the true scale, the crust of the Earth is much thinner than even in this picture, right? So most of the Earth is, is mantle and core with a very, very thin crust at the top. And you know what we're interested in in this class is the crust and specifically the stresses that develop in the crust and why the, you know, the physical mechanisms. You know, our, our interest in structural geology is really what are the to answer the question, what are the physical mechanisms that develop in situ stresses in the Earth? Because it's those stresses that influence the physics of the things that we care about that we talked about a little bit last time, like wellbore stability, fault stability, uh, issues with depletion, and other things like that. So, uh, you know. The area we care about is, is in this, the, the lithosphere, and the lithosphere includes not only the crust, but also the sort of uppermost solid part of the mantle. Uh, in most cases, the lithosphere is, well, I guess in all cases, the lithosphere is somewhere on the order of zero to uh, 100 kilometers thick, okay? In, in areas of the ocean is where it's thinnest uh, and can be as thin as like four kilometers in the ocean areas. Now, the aerial density, so like the mass of the crust divided by the area of the Earth is fairly constant. You know, it's, it's basically constant over the whole Earth. And, and that sort of makes sense, right? Because if it was, if you had an area of density that was 10 orders of magnitude higher uh, in one area, well, that area would be so heavy just due to the force of gravity, uh, you know, th th that it would just fall and sort of fall into the middle of the Earth, right? Uh, and, and that doesn't happen. So the aerial density of the crust is, for the most part, constant. Um, but again, in the oceans, it's much thinner. Okay, now why is that? Why? Why is the the aerial density is constant, but the thickness is much thinner in the ocean. Why? How could that happen? That's true. M new crust has created the mid ocean ri ridges. And what is that new crust made of? Where does it come from? The mantle, okay. So it comes up and then it cools off. It's magma that comes up to the surface and then it cools off and it forms what type of rock? Basalt, basaltic rock. Uh, where it, so basaltic rocks are much um, higher density than the continental rocks, which are mostly granite. Right? So that's, that's the exact reason. Right? So, the, so the overall, the aerial density is the same, but the local density is due to the basaltic rocks in the ocean uh, allow it to be much thinner and still have the same sort of aerial density. Uh, some some deviations in density, obviously, you know, it can't be 100% homogeneous. The, the aerial density is perfectly the same everywhere, right? That, that can't be true. So, um, I mean, you just know that from visual ob observation of the Earth, right? But uh, so in areas where there are density fluctuations, that itself can lead to stress uh, for very much the same reason I described. You, you, you have a higher density material and gravity acts on that. That creates a force or a body force on the Earth. And that body force itself can lead to stress. Uh, 
and we'll see how that occurs in more detail. So, um, sorry, I was looking at the slides earlier, I didn't reset anything. So anyway, um, you know, this idea of continental drift, uh, this is where the, the primary source of stresses in the Earth is due to tectonic motion, okay? And continental drift is sort of the precursor theory to, t to plate tectonics, right? It's not that it was incorrect, but it was just sort of incomplete. So continental drift was first proposed in like 1912. Uh, it, it wasn't actually widely believed until, widely accepted until the 50s, right? So this is not that long ago. It's, you know, we probably kind of take this for granted now, but, but you know, in my grandparents' generation <coughs> grew up and went to school and this was a, not a well, not a well accepted uh, theory, right? So the idea of continental drift is that, you know, at some time in the past, 250 million years ago, then all the continents were one, and then over time they drifted apart. Now what we, the incomplete part of the story was we didn't really know why. We didn't know why they drifted apart. It's not that people necessarily believe that they floated on the ocean. I don't think anyone believed that, but, but the, you know, the complete theory wasn't there to understand why, right? <coughs> and so, uh, you know, as, as time moved away, uh, the, the plates begin to move away from each other, and you know this is a Jurassic period is the time of the dinosaurs, like 150 million years ago. So it, it turns out that there's fossil records that support this theory as well. So in regions where the continents used to touch, uh, you'll have similar fo fossil records. So as we move forward in time, 60 million years ago. So this was around the time the dinosaurs went extinct, um, all the way to present day, right? And so, you know, the, the, the complete part of the story, to complete the story of continental drift or, or to transfer it into this modern sort of uh, plate tectonics theory, it happened in the 50s or 60s, and anybody know why? What? What, what other sort of technology began to occur in the 50s and 60s? Space exploration. Space exploration, satellites, right? So the first satellite was launched in the 50s, and, and there were quite a number of them by the 60s taking pictures of the Earth, and it turns out, uh, you know, from space, you can, you can actually see the plate boundaries. You can see the plate boundaries. And so uh, this is a map of the the major uh, tectonic plates. Um, for the most part, the oceanic plates, because they're thinner, tend to move underneath the continental plates, right? Because they're thinner and, and possibly slightly more dense due to the basalt. Um, and just the fact that they're thinner, they have a they have a sort of a lower flexural rigidity, if you will, right? So you remember from you remember from mechanics class, like we were studying beams, and like how beams bend. The flexural rigidity of a beam is like the Young's modulus times the EI, right? The Young's modulus times the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia is sort of a function of how thick something is, right? And so they have a kind of a, because they're thinner, they have a lower flexural rigidity and sort of are more compliant to motion underneath the continental shelves. Uh, they they move. In fact, there's a plate, the Juan de Foca plate, which is sort of it's uh, it's written here, but it's it's real small. You, you probably can't see it quite too well, but it's it's sort of in this region, and it, it's along the border of Washington and Oregon, and it's almost completely gone because it's been moving under the North American plate, and in another 50 million years or so, it will be completely gone. It will just disappear. Um, now the the sort of amount of crust. So if, if you know if plates are if plates are moving under one another, sort of disappearing into the mantle, you might think that that you know there's um, we're losing mass or we're losing crustal mass. But that doesn't occur for the reason that uh, Sophie Ann mentioned that there's constant regeneration. 
So there's constant regeneration uh, from these sort of oceanic volcanic activity, uh, the, the mid-ocean ridges. And these we, you know, give us a, a way to classify the different types of plate boundaries, right? So in, a, in those uh, oceanic ridges, this is where the mantle is coming to the surface, right? Regenerating new crust comes to the surface. It's cooled by the ocean water, becomes solid material. And that pushes the material away, right? Therefore, we call that a divergent plate boundary. Right? The, the edges of the plate are diverging from one another, pushed in by the new mantle, right? pushed away by the new mantle. Right? And of course, then, if they're pushing away from one another, that material has to go somewhere. And where does it go? It, it goes, you know, it pushes the, the oceanic plates underneath the continental plates, and this is what are called divergent plate boundaries. I'm sorry, convergent plate boundaries. So divergent in the ocean, right? divergent in the ocean, convergent where those oceanic plate boundaries are moving underneath. And of course, the, the, uh, the structure geology term for this is called subduction. Right? So you'd say that the oceanic plate is subducting underneath the continental plates, right? And so wherever there's a con convergent plate boundary, uh, of course, there's lots of friction. Right? So you're, you're pushing one uh, one plate underneath one another, and that's resisted by friction, a tremendous amount of friction, and that is what develops stress in the earth. Right? So you're, you're you're sort of pushing on both ends, right? So this, this plate here, if you idealized it as a, you know, just a rectangular body, it's being pushed on the right side here, and I, I've got this arrow kind of representing force. It's being pushed uh, on that end by the new mantle, and on this end, there's a force that's resisting it due to the friction. Right? So the frictional forces act in the di opposite direction of motion. Right? So if if the motion is this way, right, then the frictional force is pushing that way. And so this is pushing on or squeezing that plate and developing stress in it. Right? So that's a mechanism. Well, it turns out that, you know, the forces are not quite as regular as I've drawn, right? There's no, you know, the, the plate boundaries are very irregular. And so if I were to just have that box and just squeeze it, right, that wouldn't impart any shear loads on it. But in reality, because the plate boundaries are irregular and therefore the friction forces are irregular, what happens is I don't just squeeze the box, I squeeze it and you know, I, I, I impart, well, not me, the plate boundaries, you know, I'm not, just, I'm not just squeezing it, but rather squeezing it and imparting shear motion on it as well due to the sort of irregular plate boundaries. And when that happens, then ultimately that shear will exceed the strength of the rock, and you get these basically shear fractures or faults um, in the in the middle axis. And most of these, so these are called um, <coughs> transform plate boundaries, and most of these occur in the ocean. But there's a very important transform plate boundary on the west coast. What's it called? San Andreas Fault. San Andreas Fault is a transform plate boundary.